I'm going to teach you about a spinning ball, except it's not a ball and it's not spinning. Today in Kiskit in the Classroom, we'll talk about this quantum property called spin by looking at the experiment that first found evidence for it. Welcome to Kiskit in the Classroom. In this series, we'll use Kiskit to explore some fundamental concepts commonly covered in quantum computing related courses. Each video will also be accompanied by an interactive module linked in the description below, so be sure to check that out. Today, we're talking about the 1922 stern gerlach experiment. It's one of the most famous in the history of quantum theory because it so plainly demonstrates how quantum spin works. But that's not what Stern or Gerlach intended to show. The experiment was designed to test a new quantum model of the atom called the Bohr model, named after Niels Bohr, who proposed it in 1913. In the model, electrons went around the nucleus in discrete orbitals, and they could transition between those orbitals by absorbing or emitting photons. Each orbital had a quantized angular momentum that was an integer multiple of a tiny fundamental constant called h-bar. Back in the 1910s and early 20s, quantum mechanics was brand new. So new that it wasn't even called quantum mechanics yet. So not everyone was convinced of the Bohr model. A physicist named Otto Stern hated it. He called the model nonsense and even went as far as threatening to quit physics if Bohr were proven right. Stern was so intent on proving the model wrong, he came up with an ingenious way to test it and recruited Walter Gerlach to help him design and conduct the experiment. Turns out he didn't prove Bohr wrong. He ended up proving himself wrong. Their experiment was so simple and the results so stark, it pretty much settled the debate. Quantum mechanics rules at the atomic scale. They didn't realize it at the time, but Stern and Gerlach's experiment also found conclusive evidence for an electron's intrinsic spin, which was a new fundamental property of nature that is essential to explain magnetism, superconductivity, and much of chemistry. Today, I'll walk you through how the Stern-Gerlach experiment works, what we would classically expect to see from the experiment, and what Stern and Gerlach ended up finding. Then I'll show you how you can run your own stern gerlach type experiment with Kiskit and an IBM quantum computer. The basic idea of the stern gerlach experiment was to find a way to determine if the angular momentum of an electron in an atom was quantized, as Bohr predicted, or not, as Stern expected. They used the fact that the electron's angular momentum would also cause there to be a little magnetic field around each atom, so you can think of them as tiny bar magnets. The experiment looked like this. There was an oven full of silver atoms and a magnetic field with the north and south poles here. The field was stronger near the top and weaker near the bottom, so it produced a gradient pointing upward. Finally, there was a screen. In the experiment, the oven heated up silver atoms until they evaporated, and then they flew out of the oven, with the orientation of each atom's little bar magnet completely random. Then the atoms passed through the magnetic field. The atoms would be pushed up or down with a force that depended on the direction of each atom's north pole relative to this field gradient. Then the atoms hit the screen. Stern and Gerlach could look at where the atoms hit on the screen to learn about the angular momentum of the electrons. Stern expected that the atoms in the experiment would behave as I've been describing them up till now, like tiny little bar magnets that obey the rules of classical physics. Classically, these little atomic magnets could be oriented in any random direction. So as they travel through the magnetic field, they could experience a range of different forces pushing them up or down, depending on those orientations. A magnet pointing in the same direction as the gradient would experience a large force upward. In the opposite direction, it'd experience a large force downward. And if it was somewhere in between, it would be a weaker force. If the atom's pointing perpendicular to the gradient, then it would experience no force and it would just continue straight. Because of this range of possible forces, the atoms should all hit the screen at different vertical points. The pattern they'd make on the screen would look something like this. 
But that's not at all what Stern and Gerlach saw. Instead, they saw two entirely separate blobs of atoms on the screen with no atoms in the center. They didn't have the correct theory at the time to explain this, but we now know that they saw this because every electron has some amount of intrinsic angular momentum in the form of spin, which can only ever take on one of two values. In our bar magnet picture, this means there are only two allowed orientations of the atomic magnets. We call these two orientations spin up and spin down. A qubit in a quantum computer resembles this type of spin system. And some quantum computers actually use qubits made from the electron spin states. So we can perform our own stern gerlach experiment with Qiskit and the qubits in an IBM quantum computer. Let's map the spin up state of the electron to be the zero state of the qubit and the spin down state to be the one state on the qubit. When the silver particles came out of the oven, they had randomly oriented magnetic moments. We can model the stern gerlach experiment by creating a simple quantum circuit with a single qubit starting in the zero state. So this is called a circuit diagram, where the top wire is the qubit, and the operations applied to the qubit show up as boxes on the wire. The Rx and the Rz boxes are quantum gates that effectively rotate the magnetic orientation of the atom. We can choose random theta and phi values here to rotate the qubit a random amount. This mimics the oven, which spits the atoms out with random spin orientations. The gray box is our measurement. It tells us if the qubit is in the state zero or one and sends that measurement to a classical bit, the double line labeled C. This part is equivalent to measuring whether the atom is in spin up or spin down by looking at which spot it hits on the screen. We can use a Qiskit primitive called sampler to run the experiment many times, each with different random values for theta and phi. After 100 samples, we get a measurement histogram that looks like this. Around 50% of the time, the qubit is measured to be zero, and 50% of the time it's in state one. This is the same result Stern and Gerlach saw. It's always either spin up or spin down, but never in between. At this point, you may be thinking, well, of course we got two discrete results. We performed the experiment on a digital quantum computer, which only ever returned zero or one. And this is true, but keep in mind that the entire reason quantum computers return binary results, in fact, why quantum computing works at all, is exactly because this spin quantization that Stern and Gerlach first discovered. The qubits in IBM quantum computers are not based on spins, but many other quantum computers are. So performing a Stern Gerlach experiment on a quantum computer allows us to actually rediscover spin quantization. Since 1922, countless extensions to the original Stern Gerlach experiment have been performed. These extensions involve sending the same beam of atoms through multiple Stern-Gerlach apparatuses to see how the spins behave in different scenarios. Here's one. Let's send the atoms through one apparatus to separate the beam into two, corresponding to a spin-up beam and a spin-down beam, and then send each of those beams through their own separate apparatuses. With Qiskit, the quantum circuit corresponding to this experiment is similar to the last one, but with two measurements instead of one. Here, we've replaced the random rotations that mimicked the effect of the oven with a gate called a Hadamard. Since applying the Hadamard will give us the same measurement probabilities as the oven did, but it's much simpler to use. So we measure once and then twice, and the resulting measurement histogram for the experiment looks like this, where the bit strings on the x-axis correspond to the outcomes of the two measurements. If the qubit was measured zero both times, that corresponds to the zero, zero bit string. Or if it was measured first zero, then one, that corresponds to one zero, and so on. It looks like if it was measured spin up in the first experiment, it will be spin up in the second. Same with the spin down atoms. That means in the first experiment, we had equal probability of measuring up or down, but by the second experiment, the outcome was already determined. So the two screens at the end of each of the second stern gerlach apparatuses would each only have one spot. One screen would have all the spin-up atoms, and one screen would have all the spin-down atoms. For our next experiment, let's start with a beam of purely spin-up atoms. With an actual physical stern gerlach experiment, 
You could do this by sending them through a stern gerlach apparatus and blocking the beam that's deflected down. So all the atoms deflected upward are spin up. Now let's send this beam through another stern gerlach apparatus, but this time let's rotate the magnets 90 degrees so that the field gradient will deflect the atoms that are traveling this way to the left or to the right instead. Would we see one spot or two? or something completely different. For this experiment, we'll run the following circuit on Qiskit. We'll start in the zero state, since our beam of atoms in this experiment are all spin up. Then this Hadamard gate exchanges the X and Z coordinates so that it has the effect of rotating the stern gerlach apparatus. So now we're measuring the spin projection left or right instead of up or down. Here we get the measurement histogram that looks like this. So we can see that the spin along X can also only take on two values, which we can call spin left and spin right. So this experiment shows that if you measure the X projection of a spin that was previously measured to be spin up along Z, it'll be spin left or right with equal probability. Let's contrast this one last time to classical expectation, just to really highlight the difference. Classically, remember that I said that if the little atomic bar magnet was pointing perpendicular to the magnetic field gradient of the apparatus, the force on that atom should be zero. It shouldn't be deflected up or down. In that case, we just see a single spot in the middle of the screen. Instead, we see two spots. So half the atoms have spin left and half have spin right, even though they were previously measured to be up. So from a quantum mechanical perspective, while it may be tempting to equate spin up with a vector pointing up and spin down with one pointing down, it's not as simple as this, as we can see from the last experiment. To really understand what's going on here, we'll need to go deeper into the topics of quantum superposition and measurement, which will be a video for another day. Just as we're left with more questions about how exactly quantum mechanics works, so were Stern and Gerlach. Their experiment didn't explain everything, but it went a long way in establishing quantum mechanics as essential to understanding the natural world. It was one of the most important foundational experiments in quantum mechanics that both proved quantization of angular momentum and provided evidence for a new fundamental property of nature called spin. To really grapple with and understand the rules of the quantum world, physicists like Stern and Gerlach had to get their hands dirty designing experiments, making predictions, and sometimes being wrong. There really is no replacement for trying things yourself. So if you want to try your hand at running some real quantum experiments, head over to the Stern Gerlach module linked in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.